Good morning or good afternoon. Uh, good Erev Shabbat. I just want to begin by thanking everyone who participated in our spring soiree, especially those uh, who organized it, the committee uh, led by Erica, who just did a tremendous, tremendous job in rethinking, reimagining what the soiree could mean during this time of pandemic and managed to create an evening that was both uh, significantly lucrative for the shul in a really important way and was also really enjoyable and was really, really inspiring. I always find the soiree to be uh, an inspiring event that also is somewhat intimidating. There are so many people who care so much about the shul, and the shul has been so impactful to so many for so many years. It puts a great burden on all of us who work here uh, just to do everything we possibly can uh, to live up to your expectations and to ensure that the shul continues to be true to its mission and continues to be effective. A video was shared of the event, and I would encourage anyone to watch uh, in the coming days if you haven't, if weren't able to participate, or if you want to, even if you were, and you want to review and, and revisit the, those, those inspiring and enjoyable moments. Uh, our Torah portion uh, this morning. Uh, this 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 Shabbat uh, tomorrow <laughs> Torah portion Parlotcha uh, contains uh, the uh, loose ends, the tying up of all the loose ends that uh, are left over from the instruction manual for the Mishkan. Right, the Mishkan uh, is the focus of the second half of the Book of Exodus. The instruction manual for the Mishkan is uh, the Book of Leviticus, and then the first um, chapters, the first. Um, uh, ten chapters of the Book of Numbers are uh, further details of how the Mishkan operates and how the Israelite camp is meant to live surrounding the Mishkan, oriented around uh, the Mishkan. And in that context, the Leviim are given a special uh, special role, uh, and you can see that in the first source, if you're following along on the source sheet. Uh, God takes the Leviim instead of the firstborn Israelites who Maybe we're going to be assigned that role. It's not at Levim, and I shall um, uh, place a sign from the Levites to Aaron and his sons to perform the service for the Israelites in the Oel Moed and to make expiation for the Israelites so that no plague may afflict the Israelites for coming too near the sanctuary. El Hakodesh. Anything about avoiding plagues certainly captures our attention uh, at a year like this one. So Rashi says uh, there won't be a plague. Okay, if you go in the wrong place, uh, you'll get schmeist, okay, by a plague. And so the Levites are there as gatekeepers, literal gatekeepers, keeping the Israelites out of places they should not go. And in this way, plague is prevented. Uh, then it says to something similar but but different in I think a, a subtle but important way. He says, I knew Bishash Nigashima la Kodesh, I knew Bishat Hamamad Shayu Nigashima Mod, Allah Korban Vu Khaliot Shalov you Nizarim Karaui. Mahmat Shain Rigilim La Mod Behe Khalashem. Al Zeh Yash Gihalivim La Horotam Ech Ya Amodu. there are actually times where civilian Israelite Jews went to the Mishkan, and when bringing a sacrifice, the owner of the sacrifice would approach and would, would bring his sacrifice into the Mishkan, into the temple in later years. But an Israelite civilian Jew bringing his sacrifice to the temple might not exactly know where and how he's supposed to stand, what exactly he's supposed to do. And the Levites weren't gatekeepers, they were teachers. And their teaching uh, prevented plague by, by, by preventing the Jews coming to their holy place from standing in the wrong place, from doing the wrong thing, uh, and then incurring divine punishment. Uh, that's a very relevant uh, set of roles uh, for these religious functionaries, for these religious professionals, the original religious professionals are the Levites, uh, because both roles, gatekeepers and, and teachers, are, are very necessary in our, in our community, in our shul particularly, uh, right now, this week. Uh, on Sunday evening, we are having our first meeting of our task force for the reconvening of non-online activities at our shul. Uh, for short, I'm calling the committee Taferna, okay? <clears throat> the name, I think, is significant. It's a task force, not a committee, because I hope this task force will meet as long as it's needed, and then one day, uh, our, this virus will, will be defeated and eradicated, and we can dismantle the task force. 
It's a task force on reconvening, and we're not, which is a word that we're using deliberately. We're reconvening non-online activities. We're not reopening our shul. Reopening our shul can't happen uh, this summer, okay? Reopening the shul means young and old, uh, children and adults. It means hashkama children and kiddush. It means lollipops for toddlers, uh, uh, babies crawling across the floor, um, youth program and programming and babysitting. Uh, all happening at the same time, hundreds of people uh, gathering in our building. That's what reopening the shul means. It's not safe uh, right now. It's not safe. It won't be safe to do that probably for additional weeks or, or, or really additional months. Uh, but we can reconvene some non-line, non-online activities, okay? The shul never shut down. We just pivoted to online tefillah gatherings and online classes, and we are now going to reconvene some of those activities uh, in a non-online space, in, in real spaces. The city issued guidelines for religious institutions less than one week ago. Uh, the CRC and the OU have guidelines too. Our committee, our task force, sorry, uh, has uh, medical professionals on it, and they are going to help us evaluate these, these various guidelines and figure out what set of guidelines, what sort of timeline is appropriate for our shul. We are going to be the strictest and safest of all of them, for sure, okay? Uh, we need to find ways to make clear who should not yet return to shul, and for those for whom it may be relatively safe to return to public prayer, we have to learn how they should behave, okay? That's Rashi's role for the Levites, uh, who shouldn't go into this holy place, uh, who doesn't yet belong because it isn't safe for them, and for those who do have a reason to approach the sanctuary and to return to public prayer, uh, we need to be taught how to behave, because we can't behave uh, as we had before. What sorts of distancing, what's distancing, what sorts of cleaning will be necessary? And these are uh, items all on the agenda of the task force, as well as making sure that uh, those who are not yet able to return to shul or those who don't yet feel comfortable returning to shul for any of dozens of very, very legitimate reasons are still um, um, part of our community, reached out to and, and connected to one another and to and to our shul and, of course, to the Torah and to, uh, and to its mitzvot. So uh, in the coming days, you will, should receive a survey to gauge your interest and, and your sense of own personal safety in returning to non-online activities. Uh, and then in the days that follow, we hope to share some sort of timeline on when you might expect to see non-online activities tefillah returning to our community. It'll be small uh, and uh, limited at first, and please God, as we continue to make progress in our region at containing and defeating the virus, uh, these tefillah options will expand in number and expand in scope uh, and expand in frequency as well. Uh, I wish you all a peaceful Shabbat and a restful Shabbat, uh, and uh, look forward to seeing you uh, at uh, social distance uh, as we pass each other on the streets of Lakeview, and eventually I Hope to see you uh, as we pray together, uh, adjacent to our shul, and then even in our shul in greater and greater numbers. Shabbat shalom. Thank you for listening.